right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church. I'm so glad you're here today. If I can have our men and boys join us at the plat at the altar here this morning, we'll begin our, our service in prayer. Let's do that. First of all, let's pray. So if you guys, everybody come right at the same time, that'd be awesome. <laughs> all, all the men and boys that want to join us, little boys is fine. Everybody that can, can come, that'd be great. Just come and join us at the altar here. The rest of you that want to stay in your seats, if you just um, bow your heads and seek God's face today, okay? Let's ask him to be with us. Father, we're so grateful for everything you've given us. Lord, if, we, if, we, if you never gave us another thing, you'd have given us enough. Uh, we thank you for the cross and all it means. And Lord, this morning, we ask for your presence again. We ask for cleansing again. Lord, I pray that the word of God would be clear and plain and, Lord, to make a difference. Lord, if there's someone here today that's never heard, I pray that you'd make the gospel fresh and clear. Lord, if there's someone here that's thought about you and hasn't surrendered yet, God, I pray that you would open their hearts and show them exactly what to do. And if there's someone here, Lord, there's many here that have been heard the sermons over and over again and. God, make the word fresh to them again. Help them to, to sense um, your spirit and be clear in their lives. God, we need you. We want you. We want you to be welcome. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Our choir is going to come up and sing a good old song. I think you'll enjoy this. Swing Low Sweet Chariot. Haven't heard that in a while, right? All right. Come ahead, ladies. Turn in your song books to song number 361. Let's stand to our feet. Brother Helm's going to lead us in. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. Let's sing it out, okay? Going to be singing the Lily of the Valley, 361. 361. 
the lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. We'll sing all three verses. On that first, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrow borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn from my heart. And now he keeps me by his power. And all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore. Through Jesus, I shall safely reach the goal. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With this manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. That's good. Sing. If you remain standing, but grab your Bibles, Ryan's going to come and read the scripture. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. All right, Psalm 63, we will read together all 11 verses in unison, beginning with verse 1. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped.
Pardon me as I talk to the sound people back there. All right, you guys ready? You're going to stand up and sing This Little Light of Mine? <gasps> Surprised you, didn't I? This Little Light of Mine? Do you know that song? This Little Light of Mine. Stand up, stand up. On the platform. Stand together. This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine. You ready? Yeah, there you go. Here goes. You guys gonna sing it with them? Help them out. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine, shine, shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now here's the thing. Hide it under a bushel. Then what do you say? No. Ain't no way. I'm gonna say no really loud. You ready? Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm gonna let it. No bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm gonna stand over here. Won't let Satan, and I, I'm gonna blow up, stand over here because I'm not sure if you brush your teeth today. I'm not gonna ask you. Stand over here. You ready? Won't let Satan. I'm gonna let it shine, shine, shine. Shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, here we go. We're going to do Jesus Loves Me again. Take the lead there. Hold, hold it right here. Hold it. Hold the microphone. <laughs> All right. What? Give us a, a, a twinkle on the ivories. Here goes. You ready? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you once again for the willingness to serve you, all of them. And I just pray that you bless them in the junior church today. Help them to learn the things they need to learn. And God, I pray that um, you would you'd bless them in everything. Help them to grow up to, to serve you with all their heart and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Just a few announcements to go over with you this morning. If this is your first time worshiping with us, Welcome, we're so glad that you're here. If you would do us a favor on your way out in front of the red wall back there is our welcome booth. You'll find a stand that has uh, one of these on it. Just pick one up, open it up on the inside. There's a, our visitor's card. There's some information about who we are, what we believe, what we have going on at the church, uh, just to let you know what we are about. And then there's this visitor's card inside. If you just fill that out, you can hand it to any one of the ladies standing back there, or you can put it in our offering box back there as well. It just gives us a chance to get to know you better, but most importantly, thank you for worshiping with us today. We will have no evening service tonight, so take the evening off and rest and relax and uh, spend time with your family and loved ones, but we'll be back at it Wednesday evening for our regular prayer service uh, at 7 o'clock, so be here for that. We've been focusing a lot on uh, prayer, our five building blocks of prayer, and I know you all are enjoying, enjoying that. Um, we also have youth group during that time and kids club at 7 o'clock. So be here at 7 for that as well. We have a Harvest of Hope concert here locally that's uh, about to happen here next month, August 13th at 5 p.m. And I didn't write down the location, but I'm sure most of you... It's Peterson Park. Thank you. It's Peterson Park. And you can buy tickets on the Rural King uh, Harvest of Hope website. And then when you do that, I think they're like $25 a ticket. When you do that, you can select uh, your church to, for the proceeds to, to go to your church. And so make sure you guys do that and, and go out there and have a good time. And then we also have uh, an account set up that um, Brother Dick McDaniel helped me set up over at Harris Metals. If you guys recycle it all or drop off your, your cans or any, uh, any scrap metal like that, you can uh, say that you just want the proceeds to go to the church or school over there. So make sure if you want to go over there at Harris Metals, you can do that as well. That's all the announcements I have. I want to say one more thing about the school. As most of you know, uh, tomorrow is is our teachers show up tomorrow for our uh, their first day opening up. So we got two weeks of teacher in-service training and that kind of thing. 
So I want to say, first of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart for everyone from the very beginning of this project that's been involved in it. We're getting it really close, two more weeks, and we'll be over the finish line bringing students in. A lot of, um, a lot of new students pray for our teachers. Um, there is still some uh, financial, uh, how do I say this? We still are trying to get enough money to, for it to pay for itself. We are a goal by in six months, we, have, we, need, to get, we need to raise another $100,000 within six months. Um, so what we did out back there is a, a uh, chart, and that chart is like $1,000 blocks. I'm down to 90, so I need 96 more people uh, to give $1,000 in the next six months. If 96 more people or 96 more $1,000 bills, we'll have our goal reached for the whole year, and our school year will be taken care of. Um, we figured it up Wednesday night, didn't we, Dick? Was it 38 bucks? If, uh, if you decide in the next six months you can give $1,000, $38 a week for the next six months is all you need to commit to. 38 bucks a week will give $1,000 the next six months. If you walk out of here and you say, boy, I want to do that uh, somehow in the next six months, I want to give $1,000 to that special project for the school, just take a pen or something and mark one of those boxes out and see if we can fill those boxes up within the next few, few weeks. Um, it really takes a lot of people with a little bit of giving. It doesn't, take, it doesn't take millionaires to come and do this. It takes the little offerings that are necessary to, to make this all happen. All that many of you have already given, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's helped so much. Some students are able to come because of your gifts, and uh, that's a blessing. Continue to pray for us um, as we get things started. Um, if you're willing to, to work and help in any way, uh, that would be appreciated. Ryan, are we doing anything with the um, with the uh, lockers this afternoon? If there's anybody that can help with that. Is there anybody, what would be a good time if we had an hour to haul some of the lockers into the room? What would be a good time? Right after church? Okay, so this morning, if anyone wants, is that right after church, is that a good time? Probably not, not going to work. That's probably not going to work. I would say it's my show. Okay, so I'm going to just say this. If it's my show, I'm going to say I'm going to say uh, two thirty. Is that possible for you, for your schedule? Okay, so from let's say two thirty to three thirty this afternoon, is there anybody? I'm just going to see. Is there any guys that would be willing to haul in some um, lockers? You're not having church tonight, so we've got thirty some already in there couple guys did that yesterday by themselves two or three guys did that so how many how many of you could say i could come at 2 30 from 2 30 to 3 30 day to haul lockers well zach can help Dick can help you bro you can help there's three of you anybody else as many as i can get many hands make light work you can help to anybody else ben can help that's awesome ben anyone else can help from 2 30 to 3 30 there's four or five of you all right meet us at the school and we'll be carrying in some lockers we got to get them placed um, in there. It's, it's, it's a little bit of work. I'm not going to lie, so if you bring your muscles. If any of the rest of you, after the service this morning, you feel convicted and the Lord speaks to you and you want... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Any help you can give us would be very helpful. Otherwise, our lady teachers are going to be doing it this week. Does anybody feel guilty yet? Um, they'll be doing it all by themselves, and it's like it's like really... Um, you guys would let the ladies carry those in. Seriously? All right. No? 2.30 today from 2.30 to 3.30. Just one hour is all I'm asking from you. Can, could you not watch with me? Could you not haul lockers with me for one hour? Could you not for one hour? I say, well, the gas prices of Jesus went all the way to the cross from heaven. What else can I say? Anything else? Are you feeling guilty yet? All right, 2.30 today, if it's at all possible, come help us haul those lockers. All right, very good. Hallam, we better sing. Get me out of this mess. I remember I, the disciples fell asleep three different times, too, while he prayed. 2.30 <laughs> is a good time to sleep. <laughs> if you would, grab your songbooks as the choir comes and joins me. 448, 448. I stand amazed in his presence. Are you, are you glad to be in his presence today? Let, let's sing this song like we mean it, all right? 
We'll sing all five verses on 448. On that first, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus and Nazarene and wondered how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Sing it out. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Amen. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of life to comfort him in the sorrow he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Look at this next verse. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful is my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for thee. When with the ransom and glory his face I shall last shall see. Thy joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Sing it out now. How marvelous, how wonderful is my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. That's good singing. You may be seated. And at this time before pastor comes, we have a girls duet, a young ladies duet coming to sing for you. You pray for them as they come and sing for us. Every morning when I wake up to see the sun, I can help but think about the Lord and all the things He's done. He meets my every need. Yes, He's been so good to me, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. For all He's done. and praise him for all he's done i'll try to live my life to please him even though i don't deserve to live my life has just begun and i can't help but praise the lord for all he's done now there are many things that i could praise god for and if I started now until I died, there'd still be many more. If I could mention only one, I'd have to thank him for his son. Now that's enough to praise the Lord for all he's done. For all he's done. I'm going to lift my voice and praise him for all he's done. 
try to live my life to please him even though i don't deserve to live my life has just begun and i can't help but praise the lord for all he's done for all he's done i'm gonna lift my voice and praise him for all he's done i'll try to live my life to please him even though i don't deserve to live my life has just begun and i can't help but praise the lord for all he's done even though i don't deserve to live my life has just begun and i can't help but praise the lord for all he's done for all he's done yeah that didn't bless you your blessers broke right Praise the Lord. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. We'll dismiss the kids of the kids' church at this time. Wow. That just fills, you, fills your heart, doesn't it? Mm. Has God been good to you? Huh? He's been good, hasn't he? God's good all the time. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there rose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministrations. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying, saying please the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. What happened in the early church was, um, it was really a problem. We often say when, when a church fills up, it's a problem, it's a good problem to have. What happened was um, thousands of people were joining the church every day. I mean, obviously, you understand that it's going to be different than that it is now. You, typically, now we wouldn't have thousands joining the church because Jesus didn't just die on the cross and everybody didn't just witness that in real time. I mean, they saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw uh, amazing things happen. Over 500 people at one time saw him resurrected from the grave, walking around after they'd seen him die. I mean, talk about an emotional moment, uh, 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 an amazing, powerful time. It was something. And within 50 days, within 50 days, Peter is standing up in the middle of Jerusalem, not far from where Jesus had been crucified. And Peter's saying, you guys killed God, basically. And the one who came to save you from your sins, you killed him. You hung him on a cross, but he came out of the grave three days later. And you need to do something about that. And that day, 3,000 people came to Christ. A few days later, we have another number, 5,000. And then it says, every day the church was being multiplied. Can you imagine having seen that amazing movement of God during that time? <coughs> There was no place to meet. They were meeting in open air. They would meet in houses. Everywhere you went, you would have people on the streets talking about God, involved in what God was doing. And they were bringing their money, everything they had. 
and putting it together, piling together, and all of them were joining together. Somebody was taking care of food. People were eating. Uh, the church was paying for their food. It was, it was just constant. There was constant work. The disciples, the 12 disciples, or 11 disciples, and then the, the, the um, <coughs> other, other one that they had elected to be one of the 12, they were responsible for all this. One of them's taking care of the money. One of them's buying food stuff. And, it, I mean, it was just crazy because they were kind of doing this communal living, living kind of thing where they all kind of put all their money together into one pot and then they distributed it equally amongst them. It didn't really work. Uh, it hasn't worked. It didn't work in Russia. It won't work in America. Socialism, it didn't work in the church. With Holy Spirit-filled people, it didn't work. But needless to say, by Acts chapter 6, they are so wrapped up in trying to manage this nightmare of administration that the apostles are finding themselves busy doing the daily work and not able to teach the Word of God and spend the time in the Word of God that they, that they should. And so they said to the church, we need some guys to help carry this load. We need some people to do this. But they have to be people that are full of the Spirit of God. They have to be full of faith and full of the Spirit of God. They've got to trust God like we trust God. They've got to be exactly believe God just like we believe God. And if, if we don't have those people, it's not going to go forward. So they picked out these people. There was, um, they chose uh, six deacons, seven deacons, right? Six or seven. I didn't count them up. I can't remember. Um, I, I'm drawing a blank here. But six or seven deacons. You count them up. Somebody count them real quick. Is it seven deacons or six? It was seven. They, they, these seven deacons, they, they chose these seven deacons, and they decided to make them uh, in charge of this business and manage all of the things that had to be managed. Well, the church looked around and said, you know, there's a guy, he's always where he needs to be, always working hard, always carrying the load, always, and he just always talking about God everywhere he goes, and boy, that looks like a good candidate for deacon. I think that guy would work. And so they, the church gathered together, and they came to the apostles. They said, we figured it out. These seven guys are the ones that we think would be there. They would be the best. So um, they elected them. I want to tell you something. A lot of times in churches these days, we'll take anybody that's standing upright and breathing to work in the church and help. Because there's always so much work to do, and there's few laborers. There's a lot of people who want to talk, but few laborers, very few. And so the few laborers carry the bulk of the work. A lot of people want to make decisions, but there's few laborers. That's always been and always will be. But I'll be honest with you. What this church and every other church needs is men who are full of faith and the Spirit of God. And if you want to make a difference for God in this church or in His ministry in any place, what you need to do is focus on this, being full of faith and full of the Spirit of God. Because that is what creates an environment where a church will grow, more people will come to Christ, and we'll stay focused on what needs to be done. You see what I'm saying? It's very, very important. Some of you are sitting here, and you think, man, boy, someday I'd like to be a deacon, or I'd like to be in, in a position. I want to tell you something. All you need to do is work on this, being full of faith and full of the Spirit of God, and God will pick you. Somebody will pick you. God will choose you. Okay? Are you hearing me? It's important. But for everyone, as a Christian, can I say to you that this example of being full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith, we see it here in verse 3, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Verse 5, 
They chose Stephen, a man full of faith. Verse 8, and Stephen full of faith. This being full of faith, this is something that all of us should, should aim at. Should we not? Should we be full of faith? I've thought about this a lot. You see, what's inside, what you're full of is what comes out. Right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Psalm 23 says, my cup is full and running over. Listen to this. Uh, a mentor of mine, a pastor friend, some years ago, Paul Delmark was his name, and he, he pastors in Michigan still. He, he, I remember a preacher's conference we were at. He got up and spoke on the subject. Um, he said, speak from the saucer. I'm like, what? He was telling preachers. He said, preach from the saucer. What are you talking about? So, said, well, he said, when the Bible says my cup is full and running over, he said it spills into the, you know how you got a teacup and you got a saucer? Some of you guys, maybe, or maybe you ladies, you have a teacup and a saucer. Not me. I get as big a mug as I can get a uh, saucer. I don't have a plate big enough to take care of it or coffee. But, you know, you know what I'm saying. There's these little teacups and a little saucer underneath. If you f the idea is, in genteel company, if you, um, if you over, over uh, fill the, the cup, it spills out and it goes on the saucer so it doesn't get your tablecloth messed up. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's important. Um, I remember in Mexico several years ago, I was down there. They, they served me this drink. They call it atole. Anybody ever heard of atole? Did I pronounce it right? Maybe you don't know. It's, it's like this hot pudding that you drink. It's, it's kind of liquid, but it's almost like pudding. I, it's really amazing. Well, they'll put bananas in it. They'll put, like, chocolate in it. It has really, really great stuff. Well, this, you know, I was a little klutzy, and um, this lady had this beautiful white tablecloth. She probably washed it by the river, and I'm not kidding. That was her washing machine was the river, and she would probably pounded it with rocks, and it would probably taken her hours to get that thing white. And I'm drinking this atole, and there was no saucer underneath. I'm just saying. I knocked that cup over and spilled that chocolate atole all over her beautiful white tablecloth. And to this day, I feel guilty about it. I confess it as sin. I can't. I feel, feel horrible. She had to go back and wash. She's like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. No problem. I'm like, it probably is a problem. Wash that. But these saucers, you know, like the saucer keeps the stuff from spilling, spilling onto your nice tablecloth, right? So what this preacher was saying was, let God fill you so much that when you talk to people, you share things, share from them out of the saucer and just keep that cup full and overflowing. Does that make sense? It's kind of a neat thought. Uh, what's inside is what will come out. I want you to go back to James chapter 3 real quick. James 3, look what it says here in... Um, Verse 8, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Could the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine fig? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Look at this, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Here's what he's saying. He's saying if you have this bitter envying and strife in your hearts and you feel inside, inside you're angry, you're mad, you're angry. You're upset. You're confused. All of this stuff. He says, that's not coming from God. I know sometimes in the ministry, we get that way. I've talked to preachers who said, I don't like people. I'm like, then what are you preaching for? If you don't like people, why are you even doing this? Right? Hello? We get in ministry, in, in, in anything we do, sometimes we get so full of stress and whatever. So that's not coming from God. Verse 16, for our envying and strife is there is confusion in every evil work. Watch this, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is, watch this, it's first pure, peaceable, 
gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. See, those are the things that if you're full of God, that's what comes out of you. No hypocrisy, peace, gentleness, kindness, all those things, right? You see, if you want to live the Christian life and you want to be a good Christian, you've got to start with what's inside, what you're full of. Does that make sense? Watch this. The opposite over in 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. No, I'm sorry. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14. He's talking about wicked people. He says in verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they've exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, forsaken the right way of going astray. What are, verse 17, they're wells without water. They're, not, they're wells, but they don't have anything inside. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Think about this. People that are talking about God all the time, but nothing really inside. Nothing substantial. Huh? It's important what's in here, right? Are you, are you with me so far? Okay. Let me, uh, let me tell you, how do you get to the place where you're full of faith? How do you get there? Starts right here. Choose not to be full of some things. Some things you shouldn't be full of. Why don't you go to Matthew 23. Now the picture here, I have just, I put a, a gas pump up there. Um, no real political overtones here, I'm just saying. Uh, but I want you to remember this. I, uh, 100 years ago, <laughs> early, early days of ministry and so on, in our church when I was younger, we, there, there, there was a, a period of time where there was a lot of folks in our church who didn't have a lot of money. And the church I had, was, grew up in. And one of the guys in our church was kind of a sort of a crazy genius, just to be nice. And he discovered that there were VW Rabbits. Anybody seen a VW? Anybody here owned a VW Rabbit besides me? I had a VW Rabbit pickup truck. Anybody ever seen one of those? It was pretty cool. Um, but uh, the, the the little rabbits, um, they were the, the Volkswagen. It was the upgrade from the people's car. But you could get those little rabbits. People would sell them. Now we're talking in the early 80s, middle 80s. For $100, $200, $300, you could buy them. People just basically throwing them away. They were diesel, a lot of these. They were diesel. And so they had made these um, through the 70s when gas prices had skyrocketed to over a dollar a gallon. And you could get these, these rabbits with that. Diesel was cheaper back in those days. You could get diesel for 50 to 60 cents a gallon, depending on where you were at. Anybody remember those days? Huh? And so um, these rabbits, people were just like, well, they're diesel. You can't get diesel at every gas pump. And so they were just basically thrown away. So this one guy, I said, we had a crazy genius in our church. He would go and he'd buy these and then he'd give them away to people in the church or sell them to them for a hundred bucks. And so if you, if you came to our church during, uh, during that time, it was almost like the rabbit Baptist church because the, the parking lot was full of VW rabbits of all sizes and, I mean, kinds and colors and, you know, yellow and yellow and yellow and brown and yellow and rusted and yellow. But anyway, they were all different colors of these VW rabbits. Well, the problem was everybody had been used to going to the gas pump and filling 
the tank with gas. But these run on diesel. And I don't know if anybody has ever tried it, but I'm going to tell you just a little help here. Diesel rabbits don't run on gas. I'll never forget one guy called us one day and his, his little rabbit had locked up. And so our crazy genius had to go out there and clean the motor out. It was a big mess because he tried filling it with gas instead of with diesel. Didn't run on diesel. My point is simply this. You're a Christian. What you put in matters. You're made to take in certain things. And you're made to reject other things. And if you put the wrong stuff in to run your life, hello, your engine's going to lock up. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense to me. If it doesn't make sense to you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it makes sense to me. Thinking about that, maybe it's because I saw it happen. And I saw the, the, the engine lock up. Certain things you need to choose not to be full of as a Christian. You get that? All right. Matthew chapter 23. Look what Jesus said to the Pharisees in verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of what? Extortion and excess. Inside, extortion and excess. Verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You're supposed to have an outside that's clean, but the inside cleans first. Does that make sense? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 27, hypocrites, for ye like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Right? Full of what? Dead men's bones. Verse 28. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Choose what you're full of. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Now I want to tell you something. You can listen to any kind of music you want to listen to. I, I, I'm not even going to fuss with you about it. It's fine. Whatever you want to listen to. But just remember, everything that's going in th through here is coming in here and sticking. Right? You say, well, I just, I just work better with blah, blah, blah kind of music. Okay, that's fine. But just remember, everything that you're listening to is going in here. Huh? You might be putting gas in a diesel, in di a diesel engine. If you're not careful. So, well, how come I don't have the, the strength to, to get through? How come I don't have the faith? How come I don't? Well, maybe you're putting the wrong stuff in there. I like all kinds of different music. I enjoy listening to all kinds of music. But I'll tell you this. If I'm filling my mind and heart with the world all the time, I don't have the juice to make it through the spiritual fight I got to make it through. That's why he says, don't be drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So I just, I just need to calm down. I need a little glass of wine to help me calm down and relax me. Why? I'm just going to fill up with that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make me feel better. You're, you're letting something relax you. You're putting something into your system that's going to black out the Spirit of God. So it doesn't black out the Spirit of God. I love God more when I'm... <laughs> really? Really? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So why are you talking about that, preacher? Because probably some of you never really thought about it before. It's common, it's accepted in our, in our culture, and you never really thought about it.
But I'm going to tell you something. If you fill yourself with the wrong stuff, your engine's going to lock up. If that's what you're depending on to make you copacetic, you're doing the wrong thing. What are you filling yourself with? Are you hearing me? Amen or oh me? Huh? Think about this. What? Don't, don't give me the John 2 story. And don't talk to me about Jesus drinking wine and stuff. I'm not, we're not even in that debate right now. What we're talking about is I'm asking you, stop, stop in your mind arguing the point with me, whether it's okay or not okay. Ask yourself the question, what am I filling myself with? Is what I'm filling myself with satisfying? Is it keeping my spiritual engine rolling? That's what you need to think about. Am I filling myself with hypocrisy? Some of you are like, preacher, that's never been my problem. I've never had those problems with alcohol or whatever else. Well, God bless you. And why are you such a snoot? Why are you such a crab? Hmm? Why are you not full of God? Filling yourself with something else. Hypocrisy. Those are the things that the Pharisees filled themselves with. Lying, lies, hypocrisy, dead man's bones. See, if you want to be full of faith, you have to empty yourself of some stuff so there's room for that faith. Does that make sense? Let's go to the second thing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. And I want to say, develop an appetite for good things. Developing an appetite is an interesting thing. Do you, know, do you know that some of us, if I mentioned certain things like bacon or chocolate or, or something like that, um, you know, you, 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 you want it, you desire it, you long for it. You, really bad. You know, when I go up to the hospital, I give chocolate. It's like a Pavlov experiment. experiment. Every time I walk into the room, some of them get hungry because they see me and they think chocolate because they're, they're hungry for it. But you know, the truth is what you, what you eat, what you choose to eat develops the appetite for yourself. And you know, you can completely change your appetite. How many of you remember something you hated when you were a kid and now it's okay? Huh? When I was a kid, I hated cooked carrots. Now, to be quiet, to be fair, my dad would go to these auctions and he would buy, Gene could tell you, he would buy these, these gadgets for really cheap for my mom, like food processors. And, uh, you know, I remember one day she got this food processor. You could, you could crank it. You'd stick anything you wanted to stick in it, like potatoes or anything. And you'd crank this wheel and had this little cup on the side. And you'd put whatever you could. It would like squiggly lines or anything. And it would slice things into probably some of you still use that stuff. Well, anyway, mom decided that she was going to do carrots that way. And so she cut those carrots paper thin. And then she canned them. Now, we go get those carrots out of a jar, and you could see it was like she called it creamed carrots. Um, I'm telling you, it was thin, and you kind of slopped it on your plate, and it just kind of splattered a little bit. Cause it was, and I, to this day, I'm right now I'm thinking about gagging and throwing up because... The taste of those things was absolutely horrific. So when I got married, I told Elizabeth, she asked me what kind of things I liked. Then I said, everything you fix, except carrots. Do not cook me carrots. Or the divorce papers will be on the table the next day. You know, to this day, she cooks carrots for me. <laughs> Still married. And they're okay. I grew up, I don't, I don't mind. In fact, sometimes I'll actually put them on my plate on purpose because the way she f fixes them, once in a while they slide on accidentally. But uh, honestly, when I was a kid, I could not stand it. I would not, if I went to a, a smorgasbord, I'm piling up on meat and you can have anything green. Today she makes stuff with squash and zucchini and stuff like that. And when I was a kid, I would, I would have turned my nose up. I don't like anything like that. Now it's like, man, that's pretty good stuff. 
Of course, I'm a little more conscious of health food, you know, trying to live a little bit longer and stuff. You know, it has that thing, you know. But uh, my point is simply this. Your appetite changes based on some of the choices you make, little choices you make. If you're, if you're a sugaraholic, you start slowing that down, slowing that down, slowing that down. Finally, you quit using sugar altogether. And then after a while, you go back and everything seems like really crazy sweet, right? Or you just, you just fill yourself with that sugar all the time and you got to have it, got to have it, got to have it, more, 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 right? That's the way it is. That's the way our bodies are. Appetites are what we fill ourselves with. Right now, if I'm telling you something or if I'm talking to you and you're thinking about a particular food that you really, really like and you're starting to get hungry about for French fries or something, huh? all of a sudden your, your, your saliva glands start working and, boy, I really got to have that. I got to have that. Would he shut up so I can go to the restaurant? Hmm? Appetite really comes from what you decide you choose, what you choose to develop, the appetites you choose to develop. It's really how it is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he says in verse 1, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Desire it, choose it. Colossians, he says, set your affections on things above. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, blessed, in verse 6, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Appetites are choices you make. Proper food choices you make. Huh? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. These diet plans and some of the, you know, you can buy ready-made meals and stuff. And all of a sudden you start, you, you develop an appetite for something you never knew was even there. First time I ever ate shrimp, I thought, I've never had shrimp like that. I've never had anything like this before. And I, I got an appetite for it. Have not been able to develop an appetite for octopus. But anybody else like octopus? Frog legs? Yeah, they're, they're okay. They kind of taste like chicken. But if they taste like chicken, why not just eat chicken? I don't get it. But anyway, um, you need to develop an appetite for good things, right? If you want to be full of something, develop an appetite for that thing. Choose. Make the choice. The third thing I want to talk to you about is found in Hebrews chapter 12. Make straight paths for your feet. This is a... You want to be full of faith? This is important. In verse 12, he says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down on the feeble knees and make straight paths. Make straight paths. Make them. You design them. You can put them together however you want to. You can make a brick path, a stone path, but decide how, how you're going to walk, the direction you're going to walk. Make a straight path. Make it. For yourself. Look what he says in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Here we're talking about being full of faith, right? How? Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I want to tell you. The sprinkled blood. That's talking about, it's kind of an allusion to the Old Testament where they would sprinkle to sanctify someone. They sprinkle with blood. And it's a picture of us being saved. But going back and getting the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us. You need that cleansing every day. You need it. Um, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said. Satan sent a thorn. Put a thorn in my flesh to buffet me. And the, the Lord allowed it. A thorn in my flesh to buffet me. And the Lord said to Paul, listen, he said, I know this thing bothers you, but he said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is enough. It's my grace. Paul said, Lord, take this thing from me, this thorn in the flesh, take it from me. And God said, my grace is enough. What's he talking about? I know some people think it's talking about physical things, but I want you to understand something. A thorn in the flesh, Paul said, in my flesh, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. What's he talking about? In Hebrews, he, Paul says, lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset you. I'd like to su suggest to you that Paul struggled 
with something in his flesh that he couldn't seem to completely 100% whip. Oh, he'd fight it. He'd beat it down. He fought the fight. The Bible says at the end of his life, he fought a good fight and kept the faith. But that means he was daily struggling. He said, I die daily. He said, I struggle with this, whatever it is. Every day I struggle with it. I'm fighting it, trying to beat it back. And he said, um, God said, my grace is enough for you. So God said he, he allowed it in Paul's life to keep Paul from getting proud. Do you know what happens when people get perfect? When people think they're perfect, they're insufferable. Folks that walk around say, well, I haven't sinned since I got saved. Like, you guys stay over there. <laughs> I'll walk over here. I'm perfect now. Really? Okay. People that think they are without sin are proud and arrogant and don't even know it. But that thorn in the flesh that humbles you, you need God. You look at yourself and say, I'm weak, Lord. He says, in my weakness, I'm made strong. I hope that, I hope that makes sense to you. I want you to think about that. In my weakness, I'm made strong. Because what you realize is that you're not perfect and you need the righteousness of Christ to live through you. His grace is enough. The sprinkling of that blood, going back and saying, God, I need that blood to forgive me. I need that blood to cleanse me. That's a daily thing. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You say, will I ever overcome that? Well, yeah. Paul said he fought a good fight and he won. Took him a while, though. Huh? May take you a while. Don't quit. Don't give up. How do you make straight paths for your feet? You keep coming. To, you keep a short account with God. Every day you sin, every time you sin, you go right to God and confess it. Say, God, I know what I did. I messed up. Clean it up, right? Don't regard iniquity in your heart because the Lord won't hear you if you do that. Regarding iniquity means, means uh, putting sin on a throne in your life. Saying, that's what I want instead of God. It's an appetite for the world and the flesh. Boy, if that comes up and grabs you, fight it off. Hmm? Make straight fathers. He talks about water here in, in Hebrews 10. Our bodies washed with pure water. This is where we live. Let me say it to you this way and I'll be done. Matthew 6. Look what he says in verse... Um, 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? He said the light of the body is the eye. So what you look at, what you're following, what you're seeing, that's what's going to create the appetites. What you're filling your eyes with, that's what's going to create the appetites. And as you fill your eyes with that, Whatever you're filling your eyes with is what's going into your mind and your heart. It's what you're putting in here. You're literally putting gas in a diesel tank. And he said that what you, what you fill your eyes with is what comes inside. If you fill your eyes with darkness, darkness is filled inside. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, I bow my knee to the Father. He said, I want, I pray. That God would fill you with his fullness. That all the fullness of God would fill you. Can I ask you today, is that what you're hungering for? You know, listen, Christians. We get so caught up in petty little things and petty disagreements and petty arguments. And we don't like the way this happens or that happens. And we get all wrapped up in all that stuff. Can you just put that aside for a little bit? And let God fill you with his fullness? Stuff becomes clearer. He says, if you take the, the, the beam out of your eye, you can see clearly to help someone take the moat out of their eye. If you're, if you're full of God, 
everything makes a whole lot more sense. You get the peace and happiness that you're looking for. Oh, the stress won't go away. The problems won't go away. But your capacity to handle them will change. Huh? The people won't suddenly, everyone around you won't suddenly become wonderful. Your perspective of them, your perspective of them will change. Hmm? Why? If you're full of God. Can I ask you today, what are you full of? So, preacher, I've got, my, I got a problem with my tongue, or I got a problem with my appetites, I got a problem with this other thing, and, it, and it's stressing me out, and I'm confused about some stuff, and I don't understand why everybody, stop, put all that aside, and go to the right gas pump. Put all that aside, go to the right well, where the right water is. Fill yourself with the right stuff. Huh? And let that spill out of you. Some of that stuff will just disappear. It's like an apple tree growing apples. Apple tree just grows apples. It just happens. And what's going to happen with you is you'll just have the fruit of the Spirit. It'll just happen. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to struggle with it. It's just going to be there. Huh? Because you're filling yourself with the right stuff. What are you full of? Hmm? Are you full of faith? Are you full of confidence of God? If not, that choice is yours. Let's bow your heads and close our eyes. If you're here today and you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ and you've been thinking about it, listen, salvation is really simple. You ask Him to save you.